Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and welcome to another true life story right here with Larry Hedrick on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. I've been telling stories on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains for a little over two years now. And I never dreamed that the, the personal things that I went through and as a youth would mean anything to anybody. But some of these stories uh, people have paid some attention to and given a lot of replies. But I've got a lot of little short stories that you can't make a, short, a full story out of them because I've never had the, the um, ability to drag a story out just for the sake of time. It's always just the facts, ma'am. So I've got a little potpourri of stories here. Some that are funny and some are just weird. And uh, I thought I'd just share these short stories with you and see how it goes. Uh, almost all of these stories happened in the late 70s and early 80s. And the first one I want to tell you about was uh, about a ride that was organized by Bill Crater, who had his uh, stable located at Superstition Inn, which now has been completely demolished and it's just a vacant lot. Anyway, he had a bunch of people come in from the East Coast on foot and was going to take them through the mountains for an entire week. And they were all camera aficionados. And as I said, they were on foot. And Tom Collinborn was assigned to get them from point A to point B. Well, Tom didn't want to go out there by himself, so he asked me if I'd go along. And I did. And I, we spent an entire week in the mountains getting these people from one point to where the camp would be set up and food would be served at night and then they'd be given a box lunch and then we'd go to the next site where the camp would be set up. An entire week of that. Well, the first night out, we were sitting around the campfire. I think there were about six or seven of these Easterners that, that were in this trek and of course Tom and I and Bill Crater showed up. He didn't stay the night, but he showed up and I guess for the sake of entertainment, he began to ask each of these people, he said, what was the difference between a paint horse and a pinto horse? Well, they started coming up with some of the weirdest answers you ever saw because evidently nobody knew exactly what the difference was. And he went around to each one of these people and asked that question. But he didn't ask Tom and he didn't ask me. And finally a silence settled over the camp and he, he turned and he says, Hedrick, we haven't heard anything about you. What's the difference between a paint and a pinto? And I said, two windows and an air conditioner. <laughs> and that just hit everybody's funny bone and <laughs> we had quite a laugh over that one. On another trip, Tom and I had passed by Weaver's Needle on the way out of the mountains. And Tom had climbed the Weaver's Needle at least once, maybe twice, and he suggested that we do it again. And I thought, well, wow, what an opportunity to get some fantastic pictures of the area from the top of Weaver's Needle. So I agreed. We went home with the, uh, the thought of each of us writing out a, uh, a list of the things that we would take so we wouldn't be doubling up on carrying stuff up this sheer cliff. And, um, so when we compared notes, uh, well, we threw this out and we threw that out. And finally, Tom said, well, I see you're taking a camera too. He says, we don't need to do that. He said, I've, I've got a camera. Why don't you just leave yours behind? And I said, you don't understand, Tom. If I fall off that sucker, I want a picture on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> you might remember this story that we done on uh, finding the Canadian Club Whiskey. Uh, you can go look that story up and, and, and uh, see it on uh, Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. But there was a couple of funny things that happened there. After I had found the whiskey and they, they had sent a representative out from Phoenix to verify the find, I got a call from the CEO of Canadian Club. And the first words out of his mouth, he says, uh, Mr. Hedrick, he says, um, how would you like to go to South America? I said, I'm your man, what's up? He says, well, we're putting the next one at the North Pole and we don't want you anywhere near. <laughs> we had found that. I found that on the third day of the campaign and blew a multi-million dollar advertising campaign. And then, of course, he'd come out and somehow he had heard that I was a teetotaler. And he says, why would a teetotaler go out looking for a case of whiskey? 
And I jumped all over that. I said, well, it was election day. It was. It was Tuesday. It was election day. All the bars were closed, and I was hard-pressed to dig up a drink. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, when I was looking for the whiskey, I was out there in my Jeep, and I had a little Confederate flag flying from the area, and I was wearing my Civil War kepi, uh, Confederate kepi. And... Uh, I'm sure that if you want to know the story about the Confederate Calvary, you can look that story up and see the whole thing there. It really didn't have anything to do with politics. It was, um, it was that there were already five Yankee Calvary outfits in the state and nobody was doing any reenacting. So we were the aggressor forces. We played Confederates, we played Apache Indians, Mexican Bandinos, it didn't matter what. We were the aggressor forces and uh, lots of fun out of that. But uh, I actually offered to set on this story about finding the whiskey, and the CEO, he says, no, he says, you win some and you lose some. So he wouldn't do that, and it's very fortunate that he took that stance because the very next day, which was a Wednesday, and the little local paper come out every week, it said uh, an ominous person watched somebody dig up the whiskey. He says he didn't recognize him, but he looked like a refugee from the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> on another trip, Tom and I were up on Bluff Springs Mountain. We were over where the story about Killer Mountain was taking place and the, the pit mine and the tunnel and all that sort of stuff. And the supposed Spanish rings were Metal was driven into the rocks and had rings on them for them to tie their burrows and stuff like that. But there was some dynamite going on out there, which, which was completely illegal. And Tom thought that this was Crazy Jake. And that's another story you can look up on, the, on Mysteries of Superstition Mountain and see the whole story about Crazy Jake. So anyway, as we went down the, the hill and went out, Tom suggested that this evening well, let's go out to the Superstition Inn, to the bar out there. The Crazy Jake will be out there, no doubt. I want to ask him if he's the one doing the dynamiting. So we went out there, and we sat there probably for an hour, just listening to Jake tell all these weird stories about himself, how he was an intelligence officer in World War II and did this and did that, and it just went on and on and on. I kept wanting, well, Tom, are you ever going to ask him, you know? So, no. We went on for another half hour, and finally I just, a brick came, and I interrupted, and I said, uh, say, Jake, we were out on Bluff Springs Mountain today, and there was some dynamite going on. Was that you? And Jake got all huffy, and he, he didn't want to say anything, you know, and I can't remember the whole conversation, but he finally did calm down a little bit and said something about all these weirdos in Apache Junction. And I said, well, what's your definition of a weirdo? He says, anybody would come in here and talk to me wearing a Confederate hat. <laughs> <laughs> On another trip, Tom called me. He was supposed to take a string of horses uh, someplace, and uh, there was about 10 or 12 head in, in, involved, and he needed some help. So. Uh, we went out to Quarter Circle U, and I had five horses in a string, and he had six. And we left Quarter Circle U probably about 9 o'clock in the morning, and after several hours, we got up to uh, JF Ranch, which was some territory I hadn't been in before. And if anything happened to Tom, I'm not so sure I could have got out of there. I, I, don't, I wouldn't even know where we were for exact, uh, you know. And once we left the horses in the corral at JF Ranch, we started up this long grade to the north. And we got about uh, three quarters of the way up the grade, which was very steep. And this is about a three mile climb from the ranch. It was all uphill. All of a sudden, from dead silence come this jet airplane up over the ridge and right down in the canyon where we were. He was below the canyon, we were below the canyon. And I'll never forget that one precious moment frozen in time where I was looking at the pilot and the pilot was looking at me. And I swear to God, I could have picked that guy out of a police lineup. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. Of course, the racket, after he broke the, the ridge, the racket was horrific. But I, my horse didn't do a thing. Neither did Tom. Tom was on crow. 
Crow was used to anything. I was on Apache, and uh, I think he was just too tired of hauling me up that cliff to respond. <laughs> <laughs> One time I was up to the museum, and Clay Worst happened to be there. He was the president of the Historical Society. And this gentleman come walking in there, and he had an old map on leather that he wanted to sell to the museum. And I always thought it was he was asking $5,000 for that map, but he wouldn't show it to Clay. And, uh, you know, Clay said, well, this, this is a really old map. Huh? Said, oh, yeah, this thing is ancient. You know, it's, the leather is just hard as a rock and all that sort of stuff. And, it, and he, actually, I checked with Clay uh, not very long ago, and he was asking $70,000 for this map to the Lost Dutchman gold mine, of course. And Clay says, well, you can't expect us to dole out that kind of money for a, a map that you won't even show me. So he reluctantly laid it out on the desk and Clay looked at it and he says, uh, now this is a really old map, right? Oh yeah, this thing is really old. This is ancient. This is the real thing. And Clay looked at him and he says, well, you shouldn't have drawn that map with a ballpoint pen. <laughs> <laughs> the guy folded it up and walked out the door and never said another word. <laughs> now I'm going to tell a story on myself that I shouldn't probably tell. Hank Schieffer told this story over at the Festival of West one time in front of about 1,500 people. And I just happened to walk by when he'd done the punchline and then he pointed me <laughs> out. So nothing like being embarrassed, you know. but. We were out at the Apache land uh, and we were doing some filming on a Civil War thing. And my cavalry was there and infantry was there, artillery was there. And uh, the script called for my cavalry to attack entrenched infantry, which in real life <laughs> is tantamount to suicide. But that's what it called for. So as usual, I was on a rented horse you know, and many of the other guys, about half the guys owned horses and the other half was always renting them. And you never really know what a horse is gonna do when, it, when he's, you don't know him very well. But uh, we started off uh, at a walk and then a, a trot and then we got into the full gallop and the infantry done a volley fire. Must have been about 75 of them fired all at once. And that horse looked back at me and he says, I don't know about you, but I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and he took off. And l I was riding an 1885 British officer's saddle, which is like riding a surfboard. It, it, it makes an English saddle look deep. <laughs> and I started slipping off to the side. And it was lucky I had spurs on, ball spurs. They weren't, they weren't rowels, they just a, a ball and it hooked on the saddle as I began to come off. And my right leg was hooked in the stirrup and I was all crunched up and I had a cock pistol in my hand with the, with the finger in the trigger housing. And my shoulder was about 18 inches off the ground and I had wrapped the reins around my wrist and was hanging on for dear life. And that horse was headed right straight for that redoubt that they built. And I knew very well he could get over that redoubt, but I wasn't sure I could do it. And just then my pistol went off and the horse jumped to the left and I just laid out and took my chances. Well, fortunately, I didn't, wasn't hurt at all. But later we were over talking to the, the uh, Yankees uh, infantry and these two guys didn't recognize that I was standing there. And one of them said, hey man, did you see that Confederate officer? Man, could that guy ride. Yeah, and the other guy says, and he was shooting all the way down. Okay, well that night the filming was over and my guys wanted to attack the Yankee camp because they had a good tent city over there. And I agreed and I was walking off across the field in the dark to meet up with my guys and I walked right off an embankment. And it, it was a slope and I hit hard four times, and every time I hit, I passed gas. Poot, 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 poot. And one of the guys said, hey, the captain fell off that ledge over there. And the other one says, yeah, and he was shooting all the way down. <laughs> <laughs>
And that's just some of the weird things that, just some of the weird things that have happened to me on Mysteries of Superstition Mountains. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.